Okay, grab that right there. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, you know, glad you're here as well. Well, as we come to pray this morning, we're praying for one of our sister churches, First Baptist Church of North Kansas City. It's one of our sister churches in our association. And for uh, you longer term, older uh, Tower View folks, you'll remember it was back in 2001 that our church was invested by First Baptist North Kansas City uh, to be reestablished both in membership and numbers and also in philosophy and, and just getting us back on our feet because our numbers attendance-wise here at Tower View had dipped. And uh, because of that, uh, I think in a large part of by God's grace through that reinvesting, we are here. If you were part of North Kansas City back in the day, would you raise your hand? Amy, Nelson, Doug, Cindy, Jack, Donna, there's a few of you all left that are still here. They were the seed families that came to help reinvest here at Tower View. They left North Kansas City to come to Tower View, and many of you are still here. Thank you for your faithfulness over all these years as we do. Talk to Pastor Jim, who's a new pastor at First Baptist. I said, how can I pray for you? He said, I'm new. I just need prayers because I'm a new old pastor. I'm an old man, but I'm a new pastor at a new church. So just pray for me. And I said, brother, we'll pray for you. We, I understand that. Even in, he, I think he's in his late 50s. He still says, I, you know, eyes wide open as things are. So we'll pray for them as we do. As we come to this time, let's bow our heads together. It's good to see you this morning. We're going to be wrapping up our series in 1 Thessalonians just after we pray. Uh, but let's go before our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for our time. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to pray. Father, just once again thinking about that very fact that we just came out of a, a season for uh, our neighbors and friends who may be Muslims and, and, and their Ramadan, Lord, where they will literally spend uh, a month or so fasting through the day in, in the hope that they might be heard through their prayers. Father, there are those at the Wailing Wall who will put prayers in between the blocks of the old Western Wall, the old Temple Mount, Lord, area, hoping that their prayers will be heard. There are those who will burn incense and candles and dance around and literally whirl, whirling, dervishing themselves around and hoping to build enough uh, energy so that their prayers may be heard. Yet, Lord, we know that our prayers are heard through and only through your Son, our Savior, the one mediator, the one go-between between us and you, Father. That is your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that, and we thank you for everything that we are facing, everything that is ahead, everything that we are living in now. Lord, is, is through that name alone in Christ alone. So we pray for our sister church, FBC NKC, that you would bless uh, Pastor Jim as he's helping to fill a lot of voids, uh, Father, in the, in the transition of leadership over the years. Father, bless him, give him wisdom, give him eyes wide open. May the gospel be clear. May people be saved. May the disciples be made and sent out. That's always the prayer. So, Father, may that be true and that be so. Thank you so much. And bless their fellowship. Thank you for their investing in us literally here uh, almost 20 years ago that has led us to this place. Father, we thank you so much. Lord, as we enter your word for our last time in First Thessalonians, not forever, but at least in the series, Lord, would you be lifted high. Lord, we pray as we look at these, these little pithy statements uh, at the end of this, this book, in the light of your return, would you give us wisdom. Lord, we love you so much. We ask this today in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will be uh, in verses 16 through 28, 16 through 28, and uh, this is the last sermon in the series, the last sermon. It's hard to believe we started this the week after Easter. Guys, it is 4th of July next Sunday. Isn't that nuts? It just seems so weird, doesn't it? Uh, the pandemic is still sort of going on in our area. We're, we're in a much better place in some parts of the country. But last year, if you would have said that 4th of July this year would have come so quickly, we would have laughed in your face because it's just so different. But here we are. And we are going to close this out, not going over every verse, but our primary focus today is going to be in verses 16 down to about verse 22. I want to go through these little commands that he gives us. And we'll do a benediction, kind of a closing at the end as he tells them, what there is to be. So this is it, Countercultural Part 12. Next week, Pastor Nelson will be preaching. And uh, just want to read the word with you. If you'll join me in standing, actually, if you're able to this morning, in honor of God's word. And we'll read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through the end of the book, down to verse 28. This is God's word this morning out of the Pew Bible, the ESV Bible, as we read. Hear God's word. And Paul writes this. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in every circumstance, or all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. 
Do not quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Verse 21, hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Now, verse 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. I don't know if you're ready for verse 26. I thought we'd practice this after the service. <laughs> greet all the brothers, and I want you to know that's brothers and sisters. It's a Delphoi. Greet, greet all brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. This grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I think that would break every COVID protocol you've been accustomed to this last year. Probably won't do that, but it is important, and we'll get to that later. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you. We thank you that the Bible is timeless, Father, because you are timeless. The words that are spoken here are still as applicable to us as they were being read before that small, and what a small church it was at Thessalonica, maybe a few dozen people at best. But Lord, the, the, the truths contained here are things that we need to be reminded of. They are so obvious in this text. Father, they're so straightforward. But yet, Lord, we need reminded of these things, especially as we wait for the coming of your Son. Whenever that is, whether we pass through this life and die and be with you in heaven if we know you, or Lord, you return it before we breathe our last. May what we read here be reality in our lives. For Father, your Son chose to come to this world to die for us. That's always been the plan. And Lord, we want to honor him with our lives. So Lord, let this not just be about doing more in the sermon. Let this not just be about another checklist to have in our lives. But Father, out of love for you, like a, out of a, a love of a husband for a wife or a child for a parent or, or whomever it is in our lives that we respect and honor, Lord, may we see this not as that we have to do, but that we get to do because Lord, you have given your life for us. Thank you so much. We pray for wisdom now as we close this book in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. May be seated. Thank you so much. Well, there's a story about a lady's husband who had heart surgery. And the story goes that she received a letter saying her husband had inherited $1 million. And she was worried about her husband's health. So she called their pastor in and asked him to tell the good news to her husband. The pastor was going to visit as a pastor should on a hospital visit. And the pastor said to the husband in the hospital, Joe, if you were to have $1 million, what would you do? And Joe might have been on some narcotics when he said this and for pain. We don't really know. But Joe responded, why, pastor, I would give it to you. At that moment, the pastor fell down dead of a heart attack out of shock about what just happened before him. Joe lived. The pastor did not. Uh, we have a brother in here who had a heart surgery last year, and I had, I had to think about him. This is a joke right up his alley, if you know who that is. Well, friends, it's hard to know when our health might fail us, isn't it? Even some of the strongest people we know often fall down the quickest. And if you're of an age where you start to see people who are in fit and shape and all those things, you know how life can quickly change. You know also that, this is your public service announcement, by the way, that you need to have fitness. You need to take care of yourself. You need to eat right. Yeah, I know fried chicken after church probably doesn't count in that, but you're supposed to bring the vegetables and the fruit and all that other stuff. So you, you figure that out. You need endurance. You need, you need to get your fast twitch and your slow twitch and your muscles moving. Why? Because it's all part of being strong. It's all part of being healthy. It's all part of doing those things. If you eat Krispy Kreme donuts for the rest of your life, you're probably not going to live too much longer. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? As good as it is. Lamar's beats Krispy Kreme, by the way. That's another topic for another time. It's more amens we've gotten in probably the last year of pandemic. <laughs> Let that be. But there is no guarantee, even doing these things, as healthy as you want to be, that you will live on to be an age. First Timothy 4.8 tells us that while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. What is true about our physical life is also true about our spiritual life, isn't it? Our inner person, our spiritual being, requires attention to exercise to keep us faithful and healthy. And to be fit and ready for the Lord's service... We must be trained and fine-tuned, and we must engage in spiritual exercise. Spurgeon was asked, and I posted this on my Facebook the other day, Spurgeon, the great preacher of Baptist, was asked, which is better, which should I do more, read the Bible or should I pray? And he responded, which is better, breathing in or breathing out? And you get the point. How are your spiritual muscles doing this morning? 
Where is God revealing to you spiritual maturity in your life where you know that you need to get back spiritually to where God wants you to be? And are you exercising spiritually well as a Christian? We'll, under, we'll unpack that in a minute. But here's what I want you to see in the big idea, and you'll see it up on the screen, is simply this. Is that what the Lord requires, he enables. With every command, he meets us with his grace. As he calls us to follow him, he works on our desires, and it's all by his grace. Because this list we just read, if you really look at it and try to focus on one of them for a day, you'd probably fail at it, wouldn't you? It's so hard. But we do this out of an abundance of caution because we know 1 John 5, 3 tells us this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, if you believe who God says he is, you'll want to please him for who he is. But in doing so, it's not a burden on your back. Like Lane was out yesterday working at a, one of our members' yards, lifting all these heavy logs and things. It's not a back-breaking work. It's a freeing thing because we have been saved by grace through faith, and the law doesn't have any hold on us. Amen? And that's what we know. So the more we grow in grace, the more we pray for the return of Jesus on our good days, on our bad days, whether we're spiritually fit or spiritually not, but we pray that we honor him in all the in-between. We're going to look at eight spiritual drills this morning. You may... You know, we might just have you run in place, do some push-ups while we're at it, too. That's a joke. But eight spiritual things, they are right from the text. This is so straightforward, but I want you to know what these are. Eight spiritual drills this morning. I want you to look at the first one. These are things that we are going to be doing as we look and wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. Everything since chapter 4, where we've been, is in light of Jesus. Remember, he's coming. He said that. He's coming again. When, how, where, we don't know. He's going to come like a thief in the night. That's all Paul said. If you go back up to chapter 5, verse 1, he tells you, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, that the times and the seasons, you have no need for anything be written to you. But so much ink has been spilled about this sign here, and there's a blood moon over here, and, and, and this person got in power over here. Guys, don't be a, a headline-chasing newspaper sign-seeking, end-times Christian. Be a biblical Christian. How do you do that? These eight things. This is what he calls you to. Boy, if I would have spent more time doing these things than I would have spent reading the Left Behind series, though you know what that is, 20 years ago, great books, by the way, how much closer would I be to my Lord? Now, I'm not saying they're sinful. Please hear me. But this, Paul does not say, go and read the best fiction novel about my return, about Jesus' return. He says, go do these things. And do them for Christ's glory. So the first one is this. First spiritual drill is this. Straightforward. Verse 16, he tells you, he says, first, rejoice constantly. Rejoice constantly. And I want you to know, as we get into these, these are commands. These in the Greek are as a command, as a parent telling a child, go do this. A boss saying, go do this. These are not suggestions. These are commands given to them. And these are the shortest phrases in the Bible, even outside of Jesus wept, by the way, given to us. But he says, he says, rejoice always, or literally continually rejoice. Now, Paul is going to use this word rejoice over 24 times in his letters. You know the most famous one, many of you, don't you? Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Should have done that song today. That's back in the 80s, Craig, back when you were a young man. And, and second, yes, it's your last Sunday, brother. I'm going to pick on you a bit. In 2 Corinthians, he tells us that, the, that we, are to, we are to rejoice even when there's sorrow. Nehemiah 8.10, we went through this back in the wintertime. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The word always is a favorite of Paul's, and he loves it. He uses it four times in this book. He uses it four times in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. And in every occasion, he says, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. You are to be joyful. Happiness does not define who you are. Joy defines who you are because it's in Christ Jesus. Some situations are bad, painful, and they hurt, don't they? But joy is based rather on the fact that we are in Christ. And verse 18 tells us here in this chapter that it is his will that we be thankful through it. We belong to Christ. Friends, that's why the greatest witnessing of the church this last year was not what program you had at your church, whether you had drive-in church or whatever church, it was the joy of God's people. When everyone was trying to figure out how to get back to normal, God's people stayed constant in just being and showing up joyfully. That's a witness in and of itself. Now, it's hard, though, isn't it? It's hard to be joyful when things aren't going your way. 
when things aren't the way you want them to be, joy is hard to find. But what he tells us here and what he encourages us with is the drill we need to remind ourselves in is that we need to rejoice no matter what comes our way. Job 121, when Job lost everything, what did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't even want to imagine what that felt like. Pastor Nelson taught efficiently well on that a couple weeks ago when we started the book of Job. But I want you to know, can I ask you, are you joyful when things get hard in your life? Or are you just based upon whatever happens your way that you find happiness if it's really in your favor? Paul says, look, this life in the return and waiting for Christ isn't always going to be joyful. But you can be joyful because Christ has died for your sins. And that's where the joy is found. Second drill he has is he says, pray unceasingly or unendingly, whatever you want to call it. Your Bible says different things. Now, if you're honest, a lot of you feel the weight of this passage more than most, right? Pray without ceasing. That's like you're just some holy person that goes out in the back room and locks yourself in a closet all day. And you're just back there praying, Father, I thank you for this. And they just like feed you prayer requests. And you're just praying for everyone and everything, and that's how this works. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is, is that by prayer, we get rid of those anxieties. We get rid of those things that are in our minds. I quote this to you a lot when you're in the hospital, if you've been there. First, Thess- or, or First Peter tells us, 5, 7, cast some of your concerns on him because he cares for you. Cast all your cares on him, right? That's what he's saying. It's unfortunate this verse is prone to be misunderstood. It should be an encouragement to us. Throughout your day, keep on your mind things of prayer. When you're doing work, think about the Lord and pray, Lord, I've got a really hard problem right here. Or, I've, I, Lord, I've, I've got something before me. Would you help me? It doesn't always have to be these grand prayers. It doesn't always have to be these prayers that we pray that impress other people. Jesus warned against that, didn't he? He told us not to be like the Pharisees who pray big words and stand up in public and impress people with their prayers. He just said pray. And he encouraged us to pray how? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. the Lord's Prayer. We do these things to God's glory. But how do you pray? Here are two ways you can pray. You can praise. You can say, Lord, I thank you. For the... Lord, I thank you I made it to Tower View Baptist Church today with a whole highway closed, and I got here in one piece. That's a praise, amen? Lord, I thank you that we have chicken after church. I mean, these are simple things. But you understand, it doesn't have to be super complicated. You should have a time of prayer where you would dedicate it to the Lord. For some of you, that may be, uh, I, there's a brother here who uses that time in his car before he walks on to, the, uh, to, to go to work. For some of you, that's driving to work. For some of you, that's before everyone else wakes up. For some of you, that's when everyone else goes to bed. Whatever it is, find your time. But what he's saying here is to exercise your spiritual muscles. Are you considering prayer throughout your day? It's not just a one and done, oh, I did my quiet time, check. Is prayer on your mind as you consider what is before you and behind you and around you? It's really what he's saying. Number three, drill. You rejoice constantly, you pray unendingly, but number three, you give thanks widely. You give thanks widely. Look back at verse 18. He says, give thanks in everything. I mean, it it seems absurd, and and there must be some mistake here, right? In everything, give thanks and this is where we dare not stop too quickly, because this verse, you could preach on this whole verse. We did it a couple of Thanksgivings ago. And what do we discover? That this is the will of God for you to give thanks. But I want you to know what he is not saying here. Notice what he's not saying. We are to give thanks in all things, but not for all things. Did you catch that? If you're asleep, wake back up. You are to give thanks in all things, but not for for all things. Thank you, Lord, my mother died. Thank you, Lord, my parents are getting a divorce. Thank you, Lord, for that terrible accident that left me without a left leg. Thank you, Lord, that this world is at war and my house is next on the target list. I don't think anyone's going to be praying those prayers, do you? He says, give thanks in, not for. Friends, we don't give thanks for the sin of this world, do we? We don't give thanks for the things that are against and contrary to God's will, do we? No. We give thanks for in all things, but not for all things. That's a key difference. Because sometimes we get so focused. Well, I'm not a Christian. Lord, I'm going through the hardest time of my life. Thank you, Lord. 
Well, what if it's your sin that caused you to get there? Are you going to thank the Lord for your sin that caused you to get there? No, you're not. You're going to thank God that in your sin, he still forgives you and allows you to come back to him. That's the praise, isn't it? That's the thankfulness. For a lost person to say thank you for anything is foolishness. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you're listening outside or online. If you're here today, the only thing that you can say thank you to God for is to turn from your sin and repent and go to Jesus who died for you, who's buried and rose again, and say thank you and by faith alone in him alone to give your life to him. But for the child of God to say thank you by everything is by faith. That's what it is. Thankful in all things, but not for all things. Number four, we're halfway there. He says, and this is really going to shake you Baptist crew up. He says, desire the Spirit eagerly. Ooh. Sounds like some Harry Potter thing, doesn't it? This is not Harry Potter. This is the Word of God. Is that even still a thing? That was a big hubbub about 10 years ago. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you. Verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. What are Baptists guilty of, probably most of all? Quenching the Spirit. Why? Because we don't want to be those Pentecostal people, do we? We're not holy rollers. We don't dance in our seats, make weird noises, you know, all the stereotypes that go with our brothers and sisters on that side of things. That's not what he's saying here. Literally here, it means to not put out. This is the only time in the New Testament where the word is used in this metaphorical sense. Look, let's be clear. A believer cannot lose the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, excuse me, Ephesians 1 tells us that we are sealed by the Spirit. But he can grieve the Spirit. You can, you can sin against God and there can be a little break in that relationship. Not eternally. If you're a Christian, let me remind you again. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and he holds you like this by his power alone. If you could lose your salvation, John MacArthur said, you would. But guess what? You didn't earn your salvation, so you can't lose your salvation. So what is he saying here? He's saying that it is not, it is something that we are not to put out what the Spirit is doing in our lives. That when the God is working in your life, to quench the Spirit is to extinguish, to stifle, restrain, or stop His work in your life. When God is showing you something, you're like, I'm not ready for that, God. Talk to the hand. The face ain't listening. That's quenching the Spirit. A church, we can do that too. When God is working in our midst and we say to God, no, we don't want that here. We don't want to change God. We, 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 we just want to be the same. We're quenching the Spirit as a church. The church since its beginning has struggled to get right when it comes to ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have the corner on that market, but what I know is this, is that we as Christians have the temple of the Spirit inside of us, don't we? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And James 4, 5 tells us that the Spirit dwells in us. He yearns jealously for us. So friends, here's the point. If Christ is working in your life through His Spirit in your life and showing you something to be more like Him, and you're resisting that, you're breaking what Paul says here. You're quenching the Spirit. You're taking a fire extinguisher and going shh all over what God's doing in your life. So often we can come to church, even on a Sunday morning, and have a fight with our spouse in the parking lot, put on our face. I about said put on our mask, but that's not a thing for most of us anymore. You can put something on and pretend life is okay and walk in here and worship God with your hand raised and do all this sort of, all this sort of jazz, but really inside you're quenching the Spirit. Be careful. It's been well said, the most idolatrous hour of the week for any human, especially Christians, is that hour they gather to worship. Pray that God, you would see clearly what he's doing in your life and you don't quench what that is. Number five, verse 20. Let's read that again. He says, the fifth drill you need to see here, the fifth drill you need to have in you is that you do not despise prophecies. Wait, this isn't a Baptist verse. Prophecies and spirit. Whew, what is Paul doing back in that day? Well, you can look at this one or two ways. Literally, this means, this, this reads, do not hold in contempt these utterances. What is he saying here? The word prophecy here is in link to preaching. If you are despising prophecies, you are listening to preaching and saying, I don't need that in my life. I don't need any more of that. Stop that. You don't need to hear this preaching anymore. And friends, a lot of churches have already done that, haven't they? Now, I put this out on Facebook last week to a bunch of pastors, and you would have thought there was a, I, I don't even know, you would have thought there was a fight going on. Because some churches have a pulpit. Some churches have a table. 
And the question was, does it matter if you preach from a table or a pulpit? And then someone finally said, did Jesus carry around a pulpit with him? And that just, that was the mic drop right there, right? That solved everything. It doesn't matter if you preach from a pulpit. It doesn't matter if you preach from the back of a truck. I don't care. What matters is, is that you preach the word of God. Amen? That's what matters. And what he's saying here is if you want to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ, you will honor preaching happily. You'll honor it happily because you know that's what you need. You know that's what you want, even though you don't want it. But there were some in that day, as they were waiting for, for Christ to return, they didn't want to hear any more preaching. They just wanted Jesus to come. Amen. But in the meantime, we need it, don't we? That's like going to your doctor and saying, look, I know I'm going to die someday, but whew, those Krispy Kreme donuts are really good. Man, we don't even have Krispy Kreme around here anymore, do we? I don't, you, you guys look blank, so I'll take that as a no. Johnson County, everything good happens in Johnson County, doesn't it? If you're a Royals fan, you will remember that if they got a dozen hits back in the day, you used to get a free dozen donuts at Krispy Kreme. God is good all the time. If you're looking for a franchise opportunity, we have land next to our church. I'll just say that much. But guys, I want you to know this. I'm going to leave the side notes aside. <laughs> I am grateful at our church that we honor preaching happily, aren't you? Because this church takes it well, and you do. No matter who's in the pulpit, you listen. No matter what it said, you, you look back to the Word of God. No matter how it's communicated, you try to wrestle through it. Thank you for doing that. Pray for churches that don't. And don't believe there aren't churches that do this, because there are. Friends, what they said is this. They said, we don't need any more preaching. Just come, Jesus, come. It's like going to church like this. Don't do that. Listen to it. Number six to drill we need to do, he says in verse 21, he says we need to live life sensibly. Live life sensibly. He says in verse 21, he says, but test everything. But test everything. That's, that's where I want you to stop right there. Test everything. Boy, if we did this in our Christian lives, how much different we would be. We are not to despise preaching. We're not to despise prophecy. That is the, 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 the coming of Christ and all the things that are there. We're not to despise the, the givers of the message. But, but a question arises, does anything go? Do you just get to preach what you want to preach? Are we open to the door with our eyes wide shut while exercising no discernment at all? It's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is there's at least four tests and, uh, that we need to do. There's a savior test. So when you hear preaching, you can write these down if you are taking notes. Four things to check the preaching. Is it biblical? There's the Savior test. Does it properly honor and exalt the person and work of Jesus Christ? If that sermon has no Christ in it, then just go home. Literally walk out. Done it before. My wife and I have done it before. We've literally walked out of a church because there was no Jesus in that sermon. Last year, we visited a church on 4th of July weekend, and our daughter looked at us afterwards, and I think she was, what, five at that time, five, barely, almost six, and in her own way said, why did he not talk about Jesus? We talked about America, we talked about our founding fathers, we talked about the Declaration of Independence, all great things in their own place. There was no Jesus in the sermon. That was a fail as a pastor. I emailed the pastor, who's well-known, and I said, brother, I said, I know what you preach. I said, you got to help me with this. When my five-year-old calls your bluff, something's wrong. And his response basically was, well, we, the, our congregation needs to know about these things. What things? The history of America. Friends, I love our country. Please hear me. We come next week not to venerate America. We come next week to honor and uplift and glorify the name above all names, which is Jesus Christ. Does this preaching, you test everything with the Savior's test. Is Jesus preached? Secondly, the scripture test. Is the teaching consistent with the whole of the Bible? is what he's saying as he's preaching and teaching consistent with the whole of the Bible. The Savior test, the Scripture test. How about the Spirit test? Is the teaching in concert with what God says through the Spirit in the pages of Scripture? Those are kind of the same. But does, does, does what he's saying to you make sense in how you live it out in your life? Is it just so up here that it doesn't make any sense? Or is it practical to you, is it applicable to you that you know how to take it and live it out in your daily life? And finally, there's the saints test. What have or what do other mature godly people say about it? If, 
there's a big controversy right now among pastors because this one pastor said he, he took this sermon from another pastor. The other pastor said he gave him permission to use this sermon. It's a big hubbub. You can read all about it in the coming pages, I'm sure, this week. But one of my friends posted it this way. He said, as a pastor, if I ever have an original thought about any sermon, I'm probably heretical. I'm probably off my rocker spiritually. Every sermon I'm preaching is on the backs of other people who faithfully taught. So if someone's preaching to you and you're testing it, is what they're saying consistent with what other godly people have consistently said throughout time? That's another check. You got that? Test all things. Number seven, we got two to go. Number seven, he says this. He says, live sensibly, but he also says to keep the good eagerly. Look at the end of verse 21. He says, test everything, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to what is good. Literally, hold fast means to retain or take possession of. It, 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 it's like the Titanic is going down and you're holding on to whatever driftwood or or oar or boat you can because you know if you don't hold to it, you're going under with it. And he says, hold fast. And what he's saying here is, is he's telling us and reminding us is that the danger is not so much that you'll let it go as is that you'll let it slip away. You know, that's what happened to the Titanic, isn't it? I think historically, it's not that they had uh, this, this thing that they couldn't get around the ice. They were so focused on getting to New York City or wherever it was from England and setting a record that even though it cost them going through some of the worst ice at that time of the year, they didn't care. And Christian, you can do the same thing. You know what's right. You know what God says. And you can hold on to that in your mind, but you can settle in little things over here. And suddenly that goodness slips away because you allow sin to cloud your judgment. That happened to Achan, didn't it? How can we never name people after bad people in the Bible? Do you know any Judases in your life? Achan's in your life? Probably don't. Achan, Judges, or excuse me, Joshua chapter 7. Do you remember that? God told them, take the city, obliterate it, take nothing with you. And Achan looks around while the battle's going on, doesn't see anyone, and just do 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 I don't know how much he took, took enough. Goes back to his camp. And they go tribe by tribe. You know the story, don't you? And they get down to him, and he says, I did it. I did it. Israel just tried to go to battle against someone before that, but God said, nope, you have sin in your camp. We won't go forward until you right this wrong. And they did. And you can read the rest about it. He held on to the goodness of God. They're going to take the, the promised land. But through his eyes, just like Lot, when he looked out and saw all the lushness of Sodom and Gomorrah, his eyes lifted up. Ooh, that's great land. But it came at a cost. It came at the cost of his spiritual life. Hold fast and never let go of the good things God has for you and don't let it slip. The last thing is this, number eight. Last drill we keep before the coming of our Lord is abstain from evil totally. Abstain from evil totally. Abstain is a strong word. If you go back to chapter four, if you'll turn in your Bibles quickly, just go back to chapter four, verse three. You've seen this verse before, chapter four, verse three. He says, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Same word. He says here, it's strengthened by the fact that Paul uses it in a different way. Literally, it could read from every form of evil, abstain. Now, how do you do that? You know, a couple years ago when we had the bathroom controversy, do you remember this? Where we, you know, you can debate that about should, you know, Guys, let's be clear again. There's male and there's female. There's no binary. There's no they or them. There's he or she. That's it. We, we, we deal with compassion with those struggling with those issues, but we speak forth what, the word of God. But, but there is a big uh, hubbub among Christians saying, I'm never going to go to the grocery store again if they have a sign like that. Well, guess what? Almost every business has adopted that there's a bathroom for someone who doesn't quite understand who they are. So are you going to grow your own crops? Are you going to go buy things in the back? Are you going to move out in the backwoods and go be a hermit the rest of your life? Look, you have to live in this world. That's reality. Starbucks had this happen a few years ago. We had the whole Christmas cup controversy. Do you remember when things were bigger issues than COVID? Do you remember all these controversies? There was a big stink among Christians. Like, guys, we have lost people going to hell and we're arguing about Starbucks cups. Really? They were arguing about whether they had Christmas on the cup or not. Who cares? Nobody cares. What we care about is this. You have to live in this world. You have to use discernment in this world. 
And what he's saying here is, he's saying very clearly that evil comes in all shapes, cup size even included, <laughs> whatever it is, but be careful. Abstain from all form of evil does not mean you can't go shop at the grocery store. What it means is, is that you don't participate in things that God has clearly said not to participate in. Israel had to live in Egypt, didn't they, as slaves? Doesn't mean they adopted the ways of Egypt, though at times you'd argue they did. Friends, you have to live in this world. But in living this world, use discernment of what is good, what is best in your Christian life for your family and your church. That's why at this church, we don't just take random endorsements. We don't endorse political candidates, good or bad. That's why you don't hear me pounding from the pulpit, go vote this way or go vote that way. We preach God's word because it tells us what is true and what is not. That's our filter, isn't it? It's like when you go down to Arkansas, Brother Lane, you go to those rivers and you go and find gold. You scoop it out and you put it down and you shift it out, don't you? And you find the good stuff. Well, guess what? Life is a bunch of mud from Arkansas rivers and you have to shift it out to make sure that it works. Figure it out. But at the same time, don't allow your freedom in Jesus Christ to be a stumbling block for somebody else. Paul warned us against that. Paul said, I'd never eat meat again if it means a brother in Christ will not stumble because they know that meat has been sacrificed to an idol. Gets tricky, doesn't it? We have a lot to do before Jesus comes back. Amen? Here's what he tells you. Close with this. This is not on the screen. But he says this. Look back at verse 23. This is his prayer. It's our prayer for Tower View. It's our prayer for every Christian watching and listening. Here it is. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May God take all this stuff, Paul prays, and make it reality in your life. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's a whole topic of study right there, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, he says, I want you to know my prayer for you. I know this is hard. It's hard waiting on Jesus to return. It's hard waiting and doing these things. But verse 24 tells us, he who calls you to do this, he who calls you to his own in salvation, who calls you to wait on him, he is faithful, and he's going to do it. If you are struggling this week, I pray you look at verse 24, because guess what? He is faithful to do it. If God says he's going to work in your life, he's going to take you till the end. Philippians 1 tells us that. He who began a good work in you will, will finish it at the day of redemption. Isn't that awesome? On those days when you look at these eight things and you're like, wow, if I can even breathe in and breathe out and not upset someone or God, I'm having a good day, right? You've had those days before. But friends, Paul reminds them that he's just like them too. He says, brothers, pray for us. What are they praying? They're praying for his ministry, of course. They're praying for the gospel to go forth, yes. But they're praying that that would be true in our lives too. Would you pray that for us as pastors? That what we've said here is not just words on a screen. Because I'll be honest, I struggle to do most of these things on this list. Don't you? Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I about made a sign this week that said, free kisses, just join me up front, and I'll <laughs> give you a kiss on the lips, but I didn't. <laughs> what is Paul saying? He's saying, look, at the end of all this stuff, what it comes down to, verses 26 to 28, is about fellowship. As you wait for Jesus, as you pray for each other, as you see this as reality in your life, you have a faithful God who will do it. What he's telling you is this, is that the fellowship of the saints is the most important thing you could ever do in a week. That's what it's about. Christian, don't lose that. Sunday is not just another day. It's a day where we get to say, time out, world. We're here together for Jesus Christ. It is a busy day for us as pastors. It's the highlight of our week. My wife will start talking to me on Sunday afternoon when we're laying down, and five seconds later, I'm out. Most of you are out like that too. But friends, we wouldn't change it for the world. We love you all so much. You're welcome here anytime. Lane is going to bend my ear afterwards for making fun of Arkansas Rivers, but uh, we love him. It's applicable. It is a weird analogy. <laughs> Lane has been with us one year as an intern, and he realizes the deeper he, he gets in, he, he's asking himself, what in the world did I get into? <laughs> and God is good. Let's pray together. I invite you next week to come if you're in town. To hear Brother Pastor Nelson, I know he shared with me his big idea pretty much, his thoughts on paper. And I want to tell you, 
Nelson is one of the most passionate preachers you will ever have at this church. He does. He's like, Pastor, I love you. He's like a thermometer. It rises up and you can see it. But I can tell you that next week he's not going to preach America. He's not going to preach about a certain politician. He's not going to preach about election theories, good or bad. He's not going to preach about winning the White House or packing the Supreme Court. He's going to preach about Jesus Christ. And he's going to preach about our responsibility of living that faith out in this country that we have. I encourage you to be here next week if you're able to be. Let's pray together as we close. Father, thank you so much. Father, we thank you for these things, these eight spiritual drills that are so straightforward but so easy to forget. Lord, help us to exercise our spiritual muscles this week all by grace through faith. Help us not to will it out by our own energy or strength, but, Father, with your strength alone, using the gifts and abilities you've given us, each as individuals of this body of Christ, may we see it in our lives. Father, I pray for anyone here who does not know Jesus online or outside, who is listening to the sound of my voice now or later on, that they too would come to know that truth, that there is one way to heaven. There's nothing good we can do to get there. It's all by Jesus. Father, as we close, led by our, our pastor Craig, we love him. Three years here is dedicated service. Thank you for Stacy. Thank you for her sweetness and just her help in the uh, the pre-COVID days with the, the children's ministry and all that's there. Thank you for their boys. We pray for Seth, Luke, and Cole, all have, who profess faith in Christ. Luke, who was baptized two weeks ago. Father, grow them in, in, the, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, may the ministry that they have done here, Father, just be a continual encouragement to us. Thank you so much. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.